Hey, want to take a wild trip back in time to the Jurassic or Cambrian era? Trust me, it's going to be a wild ride. But surviving in those ancient environments would require some serious skills. At the start of the Cambrian era, the air would be as thin as at the base camp of Mount Everest. But the climate was actually pretty chill and consistent back then. However, there was one teeny tiny problem. No land plants or animals to feast on. So forget about firing up the grill for a juicy steak. Instead, you'd have to come up with creative ways to catch trilobites and other funky-looking shellfish. Good luck finding a spear without any wood or a fishing net without any plant fibers. And get ready to eat them raw, unless you can figure out how to extract oil from these creatures or burn dry seaweed. But wait, if you're looking for a more comfortable existence, you gotta travel to a hundred million years ago, to the Silurian period. Here, things start to get a bit easier. The air is still thin, but there's a bit more oxygen to go around. Plus, the climate is warmer and cozier. Simple land plants have finally made their debut. Not only that, but the first bony fish also show up on the scene. So you might actually find something more palatable to munch on. Just watch out for those prehistoric millipedes and spider-like creatures that share the land with you. They might not be the best dinner companions. Yeah, it all sounds fun and feasible, but let's talk a bit more about this crazy idea of instant transportation. If you magically appeared in a different time, the first thing you'd have to worry about is the amount of oxygen in the air. Now, looking at that fancy graph up there, it's pretty clear that oxygen levels used to be super low before about 0.85 billion years ago. Like, we're talking just a few percent of the atmosphere. And there wasn't even any O2 in the air until this event called the Great Oxygenation happened about 2.3 billion years ago. So if you ended up back then, surviving would totally depend on how fit you are. If the oxygen concentration was less than 10%, you'd probably pass out, but not pass away. If it was just above 10%, you might be able to function, but you wouldn't exactly be living your best life. Based on oxygen alone, it seems like you could survive if you showed up around 0.75 billion years ago, give or take a few million years. Now let's talk about the cool stuff on land. The first land plants didn't show up until around 450 million years ago during the Ordovician period. Before that, there were some large algae hanging around, mostly in the range of 500 to 600 million years ago. But there wasn't a whole lot going on until those land plants came along. Other forms of life didn't start showing up on land until closer to 300 to 400 million years ago. But there was this critter, a myriapod, that lived around 428 million years ago and it was one of the earliest land dwellers. I mean, if you lived back then, you'd have to come up with fancy recipes featuring myriapods. Hmm. Not exactly mouth-watering. Don't worry if you find yourself back in time before all that land action. Around 500 to 600 million years ago, the oceans were teeming with life. There were these creatures called the Edicarian fauna, and they were some of the first well-preserved organisms. Some of them probably hung out in the shallow areas near the shore, so you might be able to get your hands on them for a meal. But remember, there weren't any land plants yet, so you'd probably have to eat them raw and with no potatoes on the side. You'd have a sort of prehistoric sashimi on your plate. Now, around 500 million years ago, things started to get really interesting in the oceans after something called the Cambrian Explosion. If you ended up in the Cambrian period, you'd have all sorts of weird animals to catch in the coastal zones. Check out the fossils from the Burgess Shale for some wild ideas. Look at these brachiopods, arthropods, and even worm-like critters. But again, no woody land plants at this point, so your meals would mostly consist of raw arthropods and algae. Alrighty, let's dive into the nitty-gritty of ice ages. It's when the Earth gets super chilly for a ridiculously long time, like millions and millions of years. This causes giant ice sheets and glaciers to spread all over the place, covering massive areas of the planet's surface. Believe it or not, our planet has experienced at least five major ice ages. The very first one happened about 2 billion years ago and lasted for 300 million years. 
the most recent ice age kicked off at around 2.6 million years ago, and we're technically still in it. So, we're in the middle of an ice age, but we're not currently living in an icy wonderland. That's because we're currently in an interglacial period. During an ice age, temperatures go through ups and downs. When it's warmer, those ice sheets and glaciers start to melt, creating what we call interglacials. And when it gets colder, they expand again, which we call glacials. So right now, we're enjoying the warm interglacial period of the most recent ice age, which kicked off around 11,000 years ago. When people mention the ice age, they're usually talking about the last glacial period that started around 115,000 years ago and ended roughly 11,000 years ago when our current interglacial period began. During that glacial period, things were way cooler than they are now. At its peak, when ice sheets covered most of North America, the average global temperature was about 46 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a whole 11 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than today's global average temperature. That temperature difference may not seem like much, but it was enough to turn most of North America and Eurasia into ice-covered landscapes. The Earth was also a lot drier, and sea levels were way lower because most of the water was trapped in those ice sheets. We're talking vast steppes, dry, grassy plains as far as the eye can see. And let's not forget about the savannas, warm, grassy plains, and deserts that were also part of the icy sea. During the Ice Age, there were some familiar critters roaming around, like brown bears, caribou, and wolves. But there were also some mega cool creatures that sadly went extinct when the Ice Age came to an end. We're talking mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed cats, and giant ground sloths. Now, there are a bunch of theories floating around about why these magnificent beasts bit the dust. One idea is that us humans hunted them into extinction when we crossed paths with these megafauna. Our species, Homo sapiens, actually survived the Ice Age. We've been kicking it on this planet for around 300,000 years now, starting out in Africa and then spreading our awesomeness all over the globe. Some of our ancestors stayed put in Africa and didn't experience the full icy effects. Others ventured into different parts of the world, even braving the freezing cold of Europe's glacial environments. But we weren't the only ones out there. At the beginning of the Ice Age, there were other hominids, our closer relatives, scattered across Eurasia. We had the Neanderthals chilling in Europe and the mysterious Denisovans hanging out in Asia. Sadly, both of these groups seems to have vanished before the Ice Age wrapped up. Now, there are countless theories about how our species managed to survive the Ice Age while our hominin buddies didn't make it. Some believe it's because we're ridiculously adaptable and used our social skills, communication, and nifty tools to our advantage. And get this, humans didn't just hunker down during the Ice Age. Nope, we explored new territories and made ourselves at home. For the longest time, Folks thought humans didn't set foot in North America until after the ice sheets started melting. Fossilized footprints discovered at White Sands National Park in New Mexico prove that humans have been rocking it in North America for at least 23,000 years, right around the peak of the last ice age. Did you know that the Pleistocene era was a really important time in Earth's history? It's when the last ice age happened and glaciers covered a lot of the planet. This period of time lasted for about 2.6 million years and ended around 11,700 years ago. What's even cooler is that modern humans, like us, had actually evolved during this time and had spread all over Earth before it ended. There were also some really fascinating animals that lived during the Pleistocene, like woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats. Unfortunately, many of them went extinct at the end of this era. Earth has had some pretty wild weather patterns over the last 2.4 billion years. Although the planet is mostly ice-free, we now cycle in and out of freezing ice ages. During these glacial periods, temperatures drop and huge areas of the planet get covered in ice. It all starts with a bit of snow, which then builds up over time. The ice reflects sunlight making things even cooler. The result? Vast glaciers that slowly move toward the equator, changing the landscape as they go. 
And when the ice melts, sea levels rise again and everything changes all over again. In total, there have been at least five ice ages so far. The first one was so intense that the whole planet turned into a huge snowball. Right now, we're actually in the middle of an ice age, but we're currently in a temporary warm spell that started around 11,000 years ago. These warm periods are called interglacials, and we're not quite sure how long they last. There are still massive ice sheets covering Antarctica and Greenland that hold 75% of Earth's fresh water. When these finally melt, it'll mark the end of the current ice age. Earth's temperature is affected by something called the Milankovitch cycles. Basically, the amount of heat we receive from the sun changes over years, decades, decades, and millennia because of Earth's orbit, tilt, and axis angle. There are three different patterns to these cycles. The first is called eccentricity, which is all about the shape of our orbit. The second is obliquity, which has to do with the tilt of the Earth. And the third is precession, which is like a wobble as Earth spins. Depending on where we are in these cycles, we might experience colder or warmer temperatures. But other things, like the position of continents and the atmosphere, also play a role in our planet's fate. For example, our planet's orbit is not quite circular. It's actually a bit elongated, shaped almost like an egg. That means we're sometimes a little closer or farther from the sun, depending on the time of year. We call the point farthest away from the sun the apogee, and the closest point is the perigee. When we're at the apogee, we're moving away from the sun, but gravity eventually pulls us back toward it. This means our orbit changes a little each time, gradually shifting our position relative to the sun. Don't worry, even though the orbit changes over thousands of years, it doesn't have a big impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Changes in Earth's orbit can affect how much sunlight we get during the summer. This means that ice sheets in the northern hemisphere will melt less, and over time, they actually start to grow. As they grow, they reflect even more sunlight, which makes the climate even cooler and spreads the ice even farther. This process can last for a really long time, like 10,000 to 20,000 years, and eventually it brings the planet into its next freezing season. As for the next ice age, scientists believe it might be postponed indefinitely. They've found that our human interaction with the environment, like the use of fuels, could delay the next ice age by up to 100,000 years. Earth's past ice ages were linked to the amount of solar radiation and carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, and this research can even help us predict future cycles. It's amazing to think that our actions now could affect Earth's future for thousands of years to come. And while it's not really important when the next ice age begins, it's pretty cool to know that humans have the power to shape the future on a geological timescale. Ice ages have had a huge impact on our planet and human civilization. So it's fascinating to think how our actions now might change things, maybe even for the better. What did life look like on our planet during the last ice age, though? Well, North America, for instance, was home to some huge creatures. Mammoths, saber-toothed cats, giant ground sloths, and mastodons were just a few of them. And get this. Even Europe had an 11-foot-tall flightless bird that weighed almost as much as a polar bear. Meanwhile, down under in Australia, there was a giant lizard that lived in all sorts of habitats during the same time period. Even though some animals from the Pleistocene era aren't around anymore, you might recognize many of those that are still around today. In Alaska, for example, you can still find brown bears, caribou, and wolves. People just like us actually lived through the Ice Age too. Our species, Homo sapiens, has been around for about 300,000 years. And we've spread all around the world since then. Some of our ancestors stayed in Africa during the Ice Age and didn't feel the full effects of the cold. And others ventured out into other parts of the world, 
even into the chilly glacial environments of Europe. Our early relatives, like the Neanderthals in Europe and the mysterious Denisovians in Asia, were also around during this time. Although they seem to have gone extinct before the end of the Ice Age, it's pretty amazing to think about all those different hominids that roamed Earth during that period. What's also fascinating is how our species managed to survive the Ice Age, while some of our cousins didn't. Some experts believe that our adaptability, social and communication skills, and the use of tools played a huge role in it. And guess what? Humans didn't just hunker down during that time. We actually moved into new areas. Fossilized footprints found at White Sands National Park in New Mexico prove that humans have been in North America since at least 23,000 years ago. That's close to the peak of the last ice age. While a full-blown ice age might still be far away, there is a possibility of a mini ice age coming our way. Some scientists believe that in about 10 years, we might experience a significant drop in solar activity, leading to colder temperatures in the northern hemisphere. This could result in conditions similar to the Little Ice Age in the late 17th century, when the Thames River in the UK froze over. While scientists aren't quite sure what caused that cooling, it's fascinating to think about the potential changes. We've done it before, so we know that humans will most likely survive the next real ice age, even if we don't manage to figure out a way to stop the next freezing era. But it would come at a high cost. All the ice that would cover most of the northern hemisphere would have to come from oceans, which would cause the sea level to drop. This could mean more land for some countries, but it would also create other problems. Sea levels going down might seem like a great thing at first, but actually, it could lead to some challenges. Having been covered with salt water for thousands of years, the new land might not be very fertile. This means it wouldn't be great for growing crops, and we'd have to find other ways to feed ourselves. Back when humans first started out, there weren't many of us, and there was plenty of food. Now, with over 7 billion people on the planet, it's a different story. We'll need to be resourceful to make sure everyone has enough food to eat. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no. Its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. 
But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago, though, so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. The continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by ISAT happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So, the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing 
is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer, but when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha uh ha. -huh. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica's ice blanket makes up 70% of the world's freshwater reserves. Imagine what would happen if it melted. The global sea levels would be raised by almost 200 feet. A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell 100,000 years ago. Researchers use computer modeling to figure out its origin. They used data from 1912 and added some new information about winds and ocean currents. They concluded that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long, and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. Some people believe it was a supermoon that caused the Titanic to sink. That night, there was a rare lunar event. It hadn't happened for 1,400 years. In normal conditions, the iceberg wouldn't have traveled so far south without melting and losing the largest part of its mass. But the supermoon could have been the reason for an unusually high tide that pulled the iceberg away from the glacier way faster than usual. There's a specific type of bacteria that slowly consumes the remains of the Titanic. Salt corrosion, ocean currents, freezing temperatures, plus this rust-eating microorganism might consume the entire wreckage. American actress Dorothy Gibson was aboard the Titanic. She survived, and when she arrived in New York, she started filming a movie called Saved from the Titanic almost right away. The movie was released only a month after the Titanic sank, and in the movie, she even wore the same shoes and clothes she had during the actual disaster. 
The movie was a big success at that time, but the only known copy was destroyed in a fire. 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novella called Futility had been published, and it seemed to have predicted the whole event. The plot centered around a fictional ship called the Titan that sank during its voyage. The Titan was almost the same size as Titanic, and they both went to the bottom in April. The reason was hitting an iceberg, too. Both the real and fictional ships were described as unsinkable, and both of them had the legally required number of lifeboats, which, as it turned out later, were nowhere near enough. We've seen it in the movie, but there were some real-life love stories happening on the Titanic, too. Thirteen couples even took a trip on the Titanic as part of their honeymoon. One of the couples owned Macy's department store in New York. Once it became clear the Titanic was rapidly sinking, the woman refused to go into a lifeboat without her husband. But he didn't want to join her while there were still women and children who he thought had to go first. Then his wife gave her coat to her maid. She insisted that the maid should get into the lifeboat, and she wanted her to be warm. As for the woman herself, she decided to stay with her husband till the end. Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. People knew little about her, but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century, when a group of locals accidentally came across it. They disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. The pressure was so powerful it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. How come the crew members didn't have binoculars? It would have surely helped them spot the iceberg on time and maybe even avoid the disaster. But the binoculars on the Titanic were locked in a storage cabinet. Only one crew member had the key, and he had been transferred off the ship right before it set sail. He later said he hadn't remembered to hand over the key. But even without the binoculars, the ship might have had some time to change course and avoid the collision if the crew had gotten some warning. But that's the thing. Someone did warn them. About an hour before the incident, a ship that was relatively close to Titanic, the SS Californian, sent a message to inform them it had stopped because of dense ice field. But the warning never got to the Titanic's captain. Some experts say it was because the radio operator didn't think it was that urgent. And later, the SS Californian said they didn't get a call for help from the Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. 
Some say the crew on the Titanic couldn't spot the iceberg on time because of an optical illusion. Atmospheric conditions that night probably caused super refraction, which could have camouflaged the berg. After all, no one actually saw the iceberg until it was too close to the ship to somehow avoid the crash. Not even a whole minute passed between the moment they saw the iceberg and the collision. It was only 37 seconds, and it took Titanic 2 hours and 40 minutes to disappear below the ocean's waves. Eighty percent of what's deep inside the world's oceans remains hidden to this day. That's because the ocean covers 70% of the planet's surface, and we only have access to a small portion of that. We can clearly see around three miles deep down inside the ocean. So it's no surprise that our most recent discoveries when it comes to wildlife come from the ocean. I mean, there's a lot to explore, like this new shark species called the genie's dogfish or the longest animal ever found, a 154-foot-long jellyfish, which we just stumbled upon earlier this year in Australia. Somewhere in the Arctic and Antarctic seas, a strange phenomenon appears, confusing people to say the least. It's called frost flowers, but they're not plants at all, merely ice crystals. Frost grows on the long stem plants that manage to break the thin layer on the surface of young sea ice. Frost flowers aren't just made of water, though. They have a variety of microorganisms within, making them a small, temporary ecosystem. Turns out we don't have volcanoes just on the visible surface of the Earth. Submarine volcanoes are just as disruptive to their surrounding wildlife. If the data we have so far is correct, the ocean has the most productive volcanic systems on Earth most of them being, on average, 8,500 feet below the surface of the water. A maelstrom, a powerful and at times dangerous whirlpool, is a source of nightmares for seafarers to this day. What sets a maelstrom apart from other whirlpools is that it comes in an extraordinary size and force. It's so powerful, it can even put larger ships in a lot of trouble. One of the most famous of them is called Naruto, and it's located near Awaji Island. Its tides move in and out from 8 to 12 miles per hour twice a day, making it one of the fastest in the world. The sinking of the Titanic is the historical event that made icebergs famous, am I right? Well, sometimes these icebergs even come with colored stripes. They can be brown, black, green, yellow, and blue. Obviously, they're called striped icebergs, and they get their colors from various natural reasons, like the blue ones, for example, which turn up when the ice melts and freezes back up very quickly. If there are green stripes in the iceberg, it probably means it has some algae stuck somewhere in there. Other more earth-toned colors, like brown, yellow, or black, have other things to blame, like sediments the seawater picks up before freezing. Back in March 2019, scientists stumbled upon one of the most baffling phenomena ever to be found in the sea. During the exploration of one of the underwater volcanoes, they noticed what looked like a small lake, which was upside down. It was at least 6,500 feet below sea level. If you think that doesn't make any sense, well, that's because it's not real. Turns out it was nothing more than an optical illusion generated by the liquid in these upside-down pools. It gets up to 320 degrees Fahrenheit hot, and is made of some harsh chemicals like sulfur and metals, which makes the illusion possible. The world's largest waterfall is also safely tucked underwater. It's located beneath the Denmark Strait, a portion of water that stands between Iceland and Greenland. If you suddenly grow fish gills, dive in there, and manage to comfortably breathe underwater, you'll be able to see a series of waterfalls that begin at 2,000 feet under the surface, but then drop down to a depth of 10,000 feet. In 2011, Swedish treasure hunters discovered an object on the bottom of the Baltic Sea that they described as strange and mysterious. It's oval shape with unusual stair formations. The head of the team who made the discovery supposed it must have been constructed tens of thousands of years ago, even before the Ice Age, and could have been part of the underwater city of Atlantis. 
Experts who analyze the object believe it to be a regular glacial deposit or some other natural formation, but they still don't know for sure. Now, they don't call it the Black Sea for nothing. Located at the southeastern extremity of Europe, it even has sea smoke, which is basically steam coming out of the surface of the water. This happens because of the humidity of the oceanic water, which neutralizes the cooler wind blowing on the water surface, creating this vapor-like phenomenon. If you ever check out the ocean surface during sunset and sunrise, you might get lucky enough to see green flashes. You'll have to pay attention, though, because it merely lasts for a couple of seconds. They happen because of the natural prismatic effect of the atmosphere of the Earth. During sunsets and sunrises, light emerging from the sun gets diverged into multiple colors, a process that looks like there's a green flash emitted by the water. Red tides do happen a lot of times, and although there's no need to panic when you see one of those, you still must be careful. The technical term for this phenomenon is algal blooming. It happens when there's a rapid growth or blooming of algae in the waters of the ocean. Because of the chemicals these algae contain, they may be trouble for birds, animals, and even humans. So don't be so quick to jump into the waters should you ever experience it. Octopuses and squid have a special trait that sets them apart from other sea creatures. They have three hearts. While Valentine's Day must be very special for them. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily make them more romantic, but they do need these three hearts to function properly. They have one major heart that helps with circulation all around their bodies, and two bronchial hearts that are responsible for pumping near their gills. So, with three hearts and eight arms, when the octopus hugs you, you'll know she's very sincere. Based on a study published in 2013, dolphins have names for each other, particularly bottlenose dolphins, which have their own special whistles, just like human names. Not only do they develop this type of whistle to present themselves to other dolphins, but they can also learn other such names so they can better communicate with each other. In the depths of the Pacific Ocean, there's a mysterious singing whale, which scientists have yet to fully understand. They call it the loneliest whale, because it emits sounds at a much higher pitch than any other blue whale we've ever encountered. No one has ever seen it, though, so researchers believe its strange tune may be keeping it from actually finding a partner. Aww. Now, standard blue whales have their own particular quirk. Their hearts are more than 5 feet long. They're also about 4 feet wide and can weigh more than 400 pounds. Just to give you a better idea, your heart is roughly the size of your fist, so that would be smaller. Not that we aren't a bit intimidated by sea creatures already, but just so you know, sharks can sometimes grow thousands of teeth. And not just one or two thousand, up to 30,000 teeth over their lifetime to be precise. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see a shark's dentist bill. <laughs> Something to chew on. Scientists have yet to identify a creature on Earth that can actually live forever. But it looks like this is about to change. A tiny jellyfish that's even smaller than the nail on your pinky appears to be the living embodiment of Benjamin Button. That's because it has the ability to go back to a previous developing stage whenever it's in danger or extremely hungry and out of food. It's no surprise they earn themselves the nickname the Immortal Jellyfish. We've known about this species for hundreds of years, but it took us until the 1990s to discover their unique characteristics. We're yet to be sure how it's able to produce cells that regress and regrow, but they could hold a secret that might help advances in medicine for both animals and humans. Yep, there's ice all around, as far as the eye can see. A white desert covers the entrance to your cave, the one where you and a bunch of other settlers live. Everyone's gathered around a fire pit, trying to keep warm telling each other stories about how much snow they saw the other day. Some are running around playing tag, throwing sticks, whatever people used to do for fun 300,000 years ago. You're one of the earliest Homo sapiens to ever walk the Earth. Others are sleeping or just resting their eyes. All around the cave, all you can hear are stomachs rumbling, sounds like a wild animal lurking around. You look out the mouth of the cave, 
and see that the storm has cleared. Time to grab some tools and head out as a group. In the open wilderness, you find some berries covered in snow and plants that might be edible. But it's not enough to feed the whole tribe. It's the Ice Age, and there's not much vegetation growing anywhere. One of your friends spots some large footprints in the snow. The chase is on. You can't tell what it is, but it should be enough to feed everyone for a couple of days. As you go deeper into the snow-covered forest, you hear a growl behind you. You hope it's your stomach, but you look behind you and suddenly black out. An ice age is a period when large sheets of ice cover everything, changing the Earth permanently. It's partly responsible for the raising and lowering of sea levels, as well as the current layout of the continents. Picture monster-thick ice sheets spread across what's now Canada, Scandinavia, Russia, and even South America. That's all caused sea levels to change drastically, and temperatures around the world fell dramatically. And I'm not talking about just one ice age. There were a bunch of them. Scientists say there have been five major ice ages throughout history, lasting for millions of years. And we're in the middle of one right now. Relax, don't panic. It doesn't mean we're all going to be sleeping next to bonfires, trying to keep warm after being out all day looking for woolly mammoths. And no, there won't be a massive geological ice storm that freezes everything in its path. Ice ages have warmer periods in them that come and go, lasting for tens of thousands of years. In fact, billions of years ago, the Earth was one giant snowball with no life on it. And the Sun back then was also just a cute little fireball without enough heat to melt all that ice. But as the Sun got bigger and hotter, Earth's ice slowly melted away, leaving the green and blue ball we have today. We're living in the Quaternary Ice Age that's been going on for the past 2.6 million years, and counting. Some animals have thrived in this latest ice age, like whales and sharks. They've been at the top of the food chain for ages. Under them are seals, certain kinds of fish, otters, all the way down to tiny plankton. Up on the cold surface, mammals had to grow thick and shaggy fur just to stay warm. Ancient mammoths, rhinos, and bison were known to have thick rubs on them. They looked awesome. They were herbivores and ate small shrubs and whatever grass they could find. But several thousand years ago, temperatures began to rise, and most of these animals became extinct. The ones that remained evolved into the elephants, hippos, and rhinos we have today. You wake up from your blackout and find yourself face-to-face with a creature that kind of looks like a modern-day bobcat, except it's much bigger and furrier. It's a Smilodon, an epic version of a saber-toothed cat with a mean look. It's around the same size as a male lion and has two front fangs that make me think twice before leaving the safety of my cave. They look scary. But scientists think their bite wasn't as powerful as today's tigers or lions. What made them tough were their giant forearms used to wrestle down anyone who got on their nerves. In packs, they were even able to take down mammoths. Either way, you don't want to be waking up next to this kitty. It's staring you down ready to pounce. But you and your friends keep calm and slowly back off. You get the genius idea to throw a rock to distract it, then run. Nowadays, it's near impossible for a human to outsprint a lion or tiger, but humans back then were much fitter. Once the danger's over, everyone continues to look for food. It's getting dark, and you haven't found anything to bring back to the cave. Suddenly, you smell something burning. Way off in the distance, you see a thin column of smoke rising into the sky. Another settlement? You and your friends look at each other and approach the smoke cautiously. Homo sapiens first came into being about two or three hundred years ago. But human history didn't just pop up out of nowhere. As far back as seven million years ago, some of us decided to call it quits. We left our chimpanzee ancestors in the jungle and started doing our own thing. And that didn't just happen once. 
Over those next millions of years, there were over 20 different human species. Some were our ancestors, some were twigs from a completely different branch. Some were tiny, others better adapted for hot or cold weather. Before you know it, you see a group of Neanderthals cooking some meat, sharpening their tools. Neanderthals were the first to migrate to Europe. Scientists believe they were around somewhere between 40,000 to 400,000 years ago. They occupied all areas between Europe and Asia, while Homo sapiens, that's us, were still all the way down in Africa. You enter their camp and immediately see the differences between each other. They're stocky and look a bit different, but there are some similarities, like flat teeth for chewing and gnawing and big skulls for their big brains. They even have clothes on, like you. According to archaeologists, they lived in shelters and made tools out of stone, sticks, and bones. They welcome you inside and give you a tour like no other. You're officially meeting another human species. They take you inside their cave and show you some of their cave paintings. They were the first artists of their time. Many of their galleries are still around today, like the ones in caves in Spain. You know their style, minimalist paintings of deer, a large handprint. They also dabbled a bit in jewelry making. They made necklaces out of eagle talons and animal fangs. They were also probably the first ones to harness the power of fire. Did they discover it when a bolt of lightning hit a tree? Or when one of them dropped a rock on another rock, creating a spark? No one really knows. But they were able to recreate it and use it to keep warm, to cook food, to see in the darkness, and to protect themselves. After the nice tour, you hang around the campfire to keep warm. They even offer you some extra clothes for the journey home, mostly thick, shaggy mammoth coats. If only you could talk to each other, that would be awesome. But it's getting dark, and you need to head back to the tribe. You say your goodbyes and thank them for teaching you how to draw a deer, and for that sack of food they gave you. The Ice Age was important for the development of the modern Homo sapiens. Because of the extreme cold and other harsh conditions, they had to adapt to survive, be extra clever and innovative. They developed advanced tools and even used bone needles to sew warm clothing they may have hosted the first-ever runway show. When the climate started to get warmer, they developed farming techniques to sustain themselves and mainly settled near large bodies of water, like rivers or lakes, while others opted to be near seas and oceans. They, I mean we, were even the first to domesticate animals. Fast forward a few hundred thousand years and here we are. Phew! This summer has been turning up the heat like never before. We feel like roasted marshmallows on a sizzling grill. Yes, the world is getting hotter, but some regions have always fought with high temperatures. It turns out people had some inventions to keep themselves cool in ancient times too. Some of them are still functioning, even 3,000 years later. Let's take a look at how people saved themselves from heat throughout history. So. Put an ice cube into your cold drink and get ready to hear how people survive the heat. Speaking of ice cubes, do you know that the Persians made an ice storage system? In the deserts of ancient Persia, people had an out-of-the-box idea about how to prevent their food from turning into a melted mess. These ingenious Persians stumbled upon a physics trick that allowed them to create ice in the middle of the desert. They called these cool structures yakchals which basically means ice pits. These ice pits were not your ordinary coolers. They were like secret underground fridges. They looked like dome-shaped mud brick structures on the outside, but inside, it was a whole different world. These ice pits had an evaporation cooler system that worked like magic. At night, when the desert cooled down, Persians made use of the radiative cooling effect. They set up cleverly designed trenches to hold thin layers of water. The water froze, defying the desert heat. Then there were underground square storage areas. The Persians collected the melting ice water from these cool trenches, and during the night, they froze it again, making the most of the desert's natural chill. To add to the cooling effect, 
They built a wall to shade the storage areas from the hot midday sun. And that's not all. They had this fantastic wind-catching contraption called a badger that caught the breeze and directed it right into the ice pits. Fresh air plus ice. Cool breeze. A winning combo. They even had intricate water channels called canats to bring water to the ice pits and homes all the way from the nearby mountains. As time passed, these yakchuls faded into history and modern technology took over. But hey, there's good news too. Some awesome folks in Iran are restoring these ancient coolers. So, if you ever find yourself in the desert, don't forget to pay a visit to these marvelous places and witness the genius of the ancient Persians firsthand. Now, I want to focus more on the wind catchers because they don't just help make ice cubes. They actually function as a cooling system as well. Back in the day, those clever architectural wonders were all the rage in places like Persia, modern-day Iran, Egypt, and the Middle East. Imagine tower-like structures with openings at various levels strategically placed to harness the power of nature's breeze. These openings were like magical portals for the wind. They captured those refreshing gusts and guided them right into people's living spaces. Basically, they were natural air conditioners. The breeze would gracefully flow downward, cooling the ground as it danced through the building. The secret sauce lies in the details. The tower's height, the number of sides, the openings, and the positioning of the interior blades. Everything plays its role in how efficiently the wind towers work out. Thanks to these wind catchers, ancient societies could enjoy comfy indoor temperatures without sweating. Can you imagine living in those times? Feeling the gentle breeze whisking through your home, keeping you feeling fresh and chilled out? The Persians are often credited for inventing these awesome wind catchers. But hey, don't forget about Egypt. There, you can find traces of similar structures dating all the way back to 1300 BCE. Yes, the invention of wind catchers may have occurred in ancient Egypt, but Yazid in Iran is the city with the largest number of wind catchers. People wouldn't have been able to live there without these ancient ACs because there was almost no rain in the area throughout the year. Now, let's look at these perforated double-skinned exteriors. Imagine dressing up a building with a fancy perforated screen. It's like giving its exterior a stylish makeover while keeping things chill inside. This genius technique, firstly, scatters the natural daylight, so no harsh sunbeams to blind you. The screen also offers shade like a pro, giving the building's interior a much needed break from the blazing sun. Think of it as a natural sun hat for your home. Placing this screen about four feet away from the outer walls creates a breezy, dreamy hallway for fresh air circulation. And hey, they add a touch of elegance to the building too. These structures are sometimes called Jali. Jaipur, India, for example, has an average daytime temperature of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So these structures are lifesavers. Jalis come in various forms, crafted from cement, earth, and wood. It's a cultural symbol deeply embedded in Indian architecture. You can find its captivating presence in iconic historical buildings like the majestic Taj Mahal and the Grand Red Fort in Delhi. But hey, it's not just a thing of the past. It's still rocking modern architecture scenes and its charm has sparked creativity in artists and designers worldwide. It adorns the building's exterior, its cross-section showing a larger opening on the outside and a smaller one on the inside. This is where the Venturi effect steps in to show off its physics prowess. As the air flows through the narrowing passage, it picks up speed, creating a difference in pressure between the inside and outside of the building. Air blowing at a higher speed gets compressed, and when released, it cools down. Mashrabia is a wooden lattice or screen used in the Middle East and North Africa. These decorative wonders are like window blinds, but they do more than just look pretty. They're smart too. They give privacy, shading you from the sun, and let fresh air and light in. 
Some people also add clay pots filled with water, sand, or damp straw to their designs. As hot air breezes through the holes, it also passes through the pot's porous surface. The moisture inside evaporates, cooling the air. This is a perfect low-cost technique for hot and dry climates. It's eco-friendly, and there's no need for electricity. Now, let's fast forward to today. Designers are getting creative, mixing traditional wisdom with modern tech. At the Al-Bahar Towers in Abu Dhabi, they've got it too. Picture over 2,000 hexagonal panels that dance with the sun's movement, providing shade to the building's interior. Water evaporation was another secret weapon for ancient people. Simple, yet super effective. Plus, ancient Egyptians hung wet mats and curtains in doorways. When the air passed through them, it cooled down, providing a relief from the scorching sun. Ancient architects were the masters of maximizing airflow. They knew how to cross-ventilate and let hot air escape while inviting cooler air to the party. Speaking of ancient Rome, bathhouses were the place to be back then. It was like a community hub. People gathered to chat about politics, play sports, and, of course, take a relaxing dip. The Frigidarium was the cool spot in Roman baths. After a steamy soak in the Caldarium, Romans dashed to this giant pool to chill out. Then in some places, like Cappadocia in Turkey, people went underground to hide from the heat. They carved cozy dwellings in volcanic rock, harnessing the Earth's natural cooling powers. So the lesson here is simple. Architects and designers can create wonders by combining local traditions with smart tech. California's Death Valley boasts the highest officially registered temperature to date, with 134 degrees Fahrenheit in 1913. Meanwhile, Africa's sweltering record stands at 131 degrees Fahrenheit in Kebeli, Tunisia, as noted in 1931. In Europe, the highest temperature ever documented reached almost 120 degrees Fahrenheit in Sicily in August 2021. Then, in 2022, the UK had the hottest summer of all time. Frozen plains, icy mountains with their snow-capped tops glistening in the sun. Valleys, craters, eternal freezing winter. Wow. Hello there, Pluto. At first sight, it looks like a paradise for adventurers who love skiing, snowboarding, and all the other fun things you can do in snowy winter wonderlands. But the snow there is not like what you can find on the mountains of Earth. On Pluto, the mountain peaks are covered with frozen methane, while down here they're made of frozen water crystals. Because of its specific chemical composition, the snow on Pluto is red. The mountains themselves are very different too. They reach heights of up to almost 10,000 feet. But they're not rocky like ours, looking more like huge blocks of ice. Such a landscape cannot be found anywhere else in our solar system. But you'll need to pack some layers if you want to come visit. The average temperature there ranges from minus 375 to minus 400 degrees. When taking a look at it from a distance, you can see it has some kind of big, heart-shaped thing on its surface, called the Tumba Regio. That's actually a vast plain the size of Oklahoma, or Texas, that's covered in nitrogen ice. Scientists discovered this heart actually makes the winds of the planet blow. Craters are also big here, sometimes more than 160 miles in diameter, and some of them show signs of filling and erosion. Erosion is when land is worn away by natural forces such as wind, water, and ice. It's the same process that formed many interesting things that you can see on the surface of the Earth, like valleys, uh, coastlines, peaks, or mountains. The fact that some craters are there because of erosion tells us that tectonic forces must be slowly changing the surface of Pluto. One third of its surface is water, but not the kind that we like to drink, more like a really hard frozen ice. Water is vital for the evolution of life, but not water that's this cold, so it's unlikely that any life has formed here. At least for now. But how do we know all these things about Pluto? Well, here's the basics. Astronomers discovered Pluto in 1930, and just like with plenty other moons and planets, they named it after a figure from Roman mythology, the ruler of the underworld. Pluto was considered the ninth planet of our planetary system until 2006, after which it was 
recategorized as a dwarf planet. Despite its recent demotion, it is still the largest and the oldest known object in this region of the Kuiper Belt, an outer shell full of other dwarf planets and icy bodies. New Horizons That was the name of the very first space probe that astronauts sent to have a look at Pluto in 2006. It reached a distance of up to 7,800 miles. While there, it took some important photographs and collected lots of important information, and discovered some of the uh, mysterious cosmic oddities found on the surface of Pluto. One interesting thing about this former planet is that it sometimes has an atmosphere and sometimes not. It has an oval-shaped orbit, which means, unlike most other planets, it doesn't travel around the Sun in almost perfect circles. As a matter of fact, the Sun is nowhere near the center of its orbit. When its orbit takes Pluto closer to the Sun, the extra heat warms up a kind of thin atmosphere made primarily from nitrogen, an element our Earth also has in its atmosphere. Right after it's created, it gradually escapes Pluto's weak gravity. When the dwarf planet moves away from the Sun, the atmosphere freezes and goes back to its solid state, falling back down to the surface of Pluto as nitrogen snowflakes. Pluto's interior is supposedly warmer than its surface. Some believe there's even an ocean deep underground. Despite being the largest known body in the Kuiper Belt, Pluto is still pretty small. It is smaller than the Earth's moon, around half the width of the United States. It has five spinning moons of its own. The biggest one, half the size of Pluto itself. Our days last 24 hours, while one day on Pluto lasts 153. Earth needs 365 days to orbit the Sun, while a year on Pluto lasts 248 Earth years. So, no birthdays there at all. It sits 3.6 billion miles from the Sun, which is 40 times the distance of the Earth stands. If you were standing there, on Pluto, watching the night sky, you'd see the Sun as just one small distant star, indistinguishable from the rest. Since Pluto has been demoted, Neptune is now the most distant planet of our solar system. It's also pretty fascinating. It's actually a huge ball of ice and gas. Yes, it's the densest gas giant in our solar system. But you still couldn't stand or walk on its surface. You would simply sink in. But if you could stand, you'd notice that the gravity force is similar to what we have on Earth. Despite its impressive size, though, Neptune is not visible to the naked eye from here. It's the windiest and coldest planet. And one year there lasts 165 Earth years. Still no birthdays. It takes more than four hours for the light coming from the sun to reach Neptune's surface. Our next gas giant is Uranus. One year on Uranus asked 84 Earth years, so you can maybe get one birthday in there, but you better make a count. Just like Neptune, Uranus can't be seen without the help of advanced technology. The rest of the six planets can but you can still see all eight of them with binoculars or a smaller telescope. Now, pause the bit. See if you can make your astronomy teacher proud and try to remember which planet comes next in order from furthest to closest to the sun. You got it? That's right, it's Saturn, A+. Plus. Saturn is the second biggest planet of our solar system right behind Jupiter, and another gas giant where you'd sink in if you tried to walk on it. It's so gassy, you could put it in a lake and it would float. They call it the jewel of the solar system because it has a big ring system that kind of looks like a crown. Its rings are made up of dust, pieces of ice, and rock. Some of those pieces are as tiny as a grain of sand, while others are bigger than tall buildings. Next on the list, and completing our gas giant quartet, is Jupiter. Scientists call it a failed star since it's mostly made up of helium and hydrogen, just like the main star in our solar system, the Sun. But Jupiter doesn't have a mass big enough to start the chemical processes that turn it into a star. However, it is still the fifth brightest object in the solar system, right behind Mars. You probably have seen it when stargazing sometime, you just had no idea what it was. Okay, picture all the other planets combined and double their mass. That's a lot of mass, but Jupiter? still has more mass than that. It's also the fastest spinning planet, so it takes only 10 hours to complete a full rotation on its axis. Our day lasts 24 hours. Imagine how it would look like to squeeze sleep, work, family, friends, hobbies, movies, all that in just 10 hours. I guess I'd have to sleep once every other day if I live there.
Now, picture this. Magnificent tall mountains, giant dust storms, volcanoes, deep valleys, craters, Mars. That red jewel scientists keep talking about being a potential new home for us. There were even some small meteorite pieces found on Earth that scientists realized were ejected from Mars. That's how close we are. If you love sunsets, you would definitely enjoy the ones here because they're incredibly blue, while the daytime sky is pinkish red. But when on Mars, you'd only see the sun at half its size compared to what we see on Earth. And of course, there's Earth itself. Seas, mountains, valleys, waterfalls, and of course, light. For 4.5 billion years, Earth has been home to so many different kinds of organisms that have lived, died, and lived again. And even though we know so much about our homeland, there's always something new to discover each and every day. The next planet, Venus, is the champion of superlatives. The hottest surface, the closest planet to the Earth, the biggest number of volcanoes, 1600. If you compare it to other planets to our solar system, the brightest planet, with reflective clouds that make it so shiny you can see it from the surface of Earth. Oh yeah, and the slowest spinning body as well. It takes 243 Earth days for Venus to make just one single turn. You could literally walk faster than the planet's rotational speed. Venus also goes in the opposite direction of Earth, so sunsets there are set in the east, sunrises in the west. And last, but not least, Mercury. It doesn't have any moons or rings, and it's the smallest planet in our solar system. A year there lasts only 88 days. So get ready to expand that birthday budget. Mercury is the planet the closest to the sun, but not the hottest. Venus took that title. Mercury is not the hottest because there's no atmosphere to trap the sun's heat there. But it does have wrinkles. Only one half of Mercury's surface faces the sun at any given time, meaning there's an incredible difference in the temperature on either side, and of course these sides switch as the planet rotates. The iron core of this planet has cooled and contracted over millions of years due to the rapid change in heat, which is why wrinkles have appeared on its surface. Well, that's a brief tour of all the planets of our solar system. And one dwarf planet. Sorry, Pluto. Thanks for watching. Over a century ago, the Titanic struck an iceberg and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Of the 2,240 people on board, only around 700 survived. Since then, the tragedy has been the subject of endless movies, documentaries, and books. And though we've learned a lot about the ship and many of the people on board, we hardly know anything about the iceberg responsible for the catastrophe, especially anything concerning its size. But maybe we can find some clues. The Titanic was constructed by the White Star Line as part of its new fleet of passenger liners. At the time, it was the largest ship ever built, and it lived up to its name. The ship was 883 feet long, equal to two and a half soccer fields placed end to end, and 175 feet tall, which is close to 10 giraffes standing on top of one another. From the waterline to the deck alone, the boat was 60 feet high, that's close to the height of a four-story building. The Titanic was big enough to have veranda cafes, a restaurant, a reading and writing room, a Turkish bath, a gym, and squash courts. There was even space for a swimming pool. The liner could carry a total of 3,300 people, including 2,435 passengers and 900 crew members. Although luxury was important, safety was paramount. The Titanic had been designed to have 16 watertight compartments below its deck. If the ship's hull was somehow compromised in an accident, up to four of these compartments could take on the water, while the remaining 12 would keep the ship afloat. Philip Franklin, vice president of the White Star Line, said this was what made the ship truly remarkable. It's believed that the man said, There is no danger the Titanic will sink. The boat is unsinkable, and nothing but inconvenience will be suffered by the passengers. He was so very wrong. The ship left England for its first and last voyage on April 10, 1912. And all it took was a single iceberg to bring that mighty vessel down. Icebergs are fascinating. They are formed during a process called calving when large chunks of freshwater ice break free from glaciers and float away into open water. 
they eventually melt away and disappear. In the Northern Hemisphere, the majority of these icebergs come from Greenland. In the South, they come from Antarctica. What you see on top of the water is only a small portion of an iceberg. This is just the tip. Most of it, up to 90%, is hidden under the water. Only when you examine pictures of the entire thing can you truly appreciate how massive icebergs are. It's the part of the iceberg you can't see that is often the most dangerous. Beneath the waves, it can have jagged edges in random places. A ship can easily get too close without realizing it, resulting in serious damage to the bottom of the boat. And it's not just big icebergs you have to watch out for. Smaller ones, which are more difficult to spot, can prove to be just as dangerous. A growler, for example, is under 7 feet long, with just a bit more than 3 feet showing above the water. And a slightly larger bergy bit is less than 15 feet in size. The dangers of icebergs were well known when the Titanic set sail. In 1901, the Islander was traveling through the inside passage to Alaska. It collided with an iceberg and sank immediately. Luckily, 138 of the 178 people on board made it to safety. Back then, there wasn't any special equipment for detecting icebergs. The best tool was your eyes. From a special vantage point above the ship called the crow's nest, two members of the crew had to stare out over the ocean and watch for potential hazards. The crow's nest was located at the front of the ship, 49 feet above the deck. It was attached to the mast. From this height, a person had a good view of the ocean. If they saw anything suspicious, they could ring a large bell to sound the alarm. After that, they could call from a special telephone to warn the captain of any danger. But imagine what a horrible job this would have been, especially on the night the Titanic sank. The crow's nest wasn't a warm and cozy room surrounded by windows. Instead, it was a large open tub exposed to the elements. On April 14, 1912, the air temperature was around 39 degrees Fahrenheit, which is close to freezing. With the ship moving at about 23 knots, more than 26 miles per hour, the sailors must have felt that frigid cold air pressing against any exposed skin. The only good thing about the job was that the shift only lasted two hours. Frederick Fleet was the sailor who actually spotted the iceberg that sank the Titanic. He was up in the crow's nest, working with Reginald Lee at the time. Fleet kept track of the left side of the ship, while Lee scanned the right. It was 10 p.m. when the two men started their shift. They had already been warned about the possibility of ice. But when you're cold and it's dark, it might feel like an impossible task. Even worse, the two men didn't even have binoculars to make the job any easier. Fleet would later insist that having binoculars would have prevented the tragedy. With about 20 minutes remaining on the job, the sailors noticed the iceberg. Fleet rang the bell once, twice, and again. He then called up to the bridge to inform the crew. At first, the call seemed to come in the nick of time. The ship's engines reversed, and the massive ocean liner managed to turn. It wasn't enough to miss the iceberg, though. Ice showered down onto the ship's deck. The iceberg tore through the hull, and water flooded in. Two hours and 40 minutes later, the Titanic was gone. And here we have clue number one. The iceberg was big enough to be spotted with the unaided eye in the dark of the night without any binoculars. It was also tall enough for bits of ice to fall down onto the ship's deck. Since this all took place long before social media and smartphones, nobody on board would have been taking photos or videos at the time. So, of course, we don't have any footage of the actual iceberg. But there are photos of the possible iceberg from later that day. The SS Prinz Adalbert was sailing near the area on the morning of April 15, 1912. The steward on the ship had not yet heard about what had happened to the Titanic. But when he spotted an iceberg floating by, he was compelled to photograph it. Why? There was a line of red paint along the bottom of the iceberg, indicating that it had likely collided with a ship sometime within the previous 12 hours. A second photo was taken from a ship called the Minia, which was sent into the area to look for debris from the collision. Captain de Carteret said that among the wreckage, he had seen only one iceberg. He also noticed a streak of red paint on it. From the photos and witness accounts, 
Newspaper reports estimated the iceberg to be 50 to 100 feet high and 200 to 400 feet long. That's clue number two. The iceberg that hit the Titanic probably started its ocean journey from Greenland's coast, heading past the Baffin Bay to the Davis Strait. From here, it must have slipped through the Labrador Sea and finally reached the Atlantic. And that, in itself, is pretty impressive. The glaciers in Greenland create between 15,000 to 30,000 icebergs each year. Some small, some big. Of these, a mere 1% will actually make it to the Atlantic. The others simply melt along the way. We know that the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean, where the sinking took place, was around 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's below freezing. For humans, this could cause frostbite or hypothermia. But that temperature is actually warm for an iceberg. Most would only last two to three years in the North Atlantic, slowly melting into the warmer water. Based on this, it's likely that the Titanic's iceberg left Greenland in 1910 or 1911 and was fully melted by late 1912 or 1913. But since it did make it to the Atlantic and managed to cause significant damage to the ship, we have clue number three. We will never know for certain the size of the iceberg from that day, but we do know that it definitely wasn't a growler or a bergy bit. Both those types of icebergs are much too small. And if the ice was indeed scattered across the deck during the collision, the iceberg must have been a little taller than 60 feet. The newspaper estimates are probably as close as we're going to get. The iceberg that took down the Titanic was indeed a formidable one. And icebergs are still a threat. As recently as 2007, the cruise ship Explorer struck one and sank in Antarctica's Weddell Sea. Luckily, everybody survived. The International Ice Patrol was created in 1914 following the Titanic's sinking. The organization is still in operation today, made up of representatives from several countries. Using airplanes and radar, the patrol locates and tracks larger icebergs, making the information available to anyone who needs it and preventing more ocean tragedies in the process. Cold snow, wind, and despair. Twelve people, two of them little children, stranded in the broken ice of the Arctic for over six months with no hope of rescue. Starving and desperate, the shipwreck survivors were looking strangely at the kids and thinking of the unimaginable. In 1913, anthropologist Wilhelmer Stephenson, only recently returned from an Arctic expedition, set out to prepare for another one. His aim was to study the peoples of northern Canada and the islands off the country's shores, as well as to map the blank region of the Beaufort Sea. He successfully received financing from several sources, but he was pressed to depart in June. That left him with less than six months to prepare, and although he later claimed he'd had enough time to foresee everything, that was hardly the case. Eventually, the expedition included two parties, the Northern Party, headed by Stephenson himself, was to explore the white spots on the map, while the Southern Party, led by zoologist Rudolf Anderson, was tasked with anthropology studies on the islands. Bad omens began appearing even before departure, though. There were disputes about the lack of provisions for such a daring expedition, and the trip leader's exact plans weren't clear to anyone. But all that paled in comparison with the Northern Party's ship herself. When Robert Bartlett, captain of the ship, saw the Carlock for the first time, he became extremely wary of the whole enterprise. It was a 29-year-old fishing vessel converted for whaling. Although it had a reinforced hull and had already been in the Arctic waters before, Bartlett, an experienced seaman, saw she wasn't fit to withstand being locked in the ice for long and wouldn't be able to break the ice either. Still, he agreed to take part in the expedition not knowing it would be a fateful decision. On her way north, the Car Luck was taking newcomers on board. First, Stephenson took on 28 sled dogs and two Inuit hunters. When the ship was trapped in ice for some time, he took a foot trip to the nearby island, where he brought his old-time friend John Hadley and two more native hunters. One of them took his wife and two little daughters, seven and two years old. Then, finally, the ship sailed east to the meeting point, 
All the time, however, the ice was so tightly packed that they literally had to maneuver their way. It was clear they wouldn't be able to make it north, as had been planned, but the reality was much worse. On the morning of August 13th, more than halfway to their destination, the pack ice quickly came from all directions and locked the car lock. Try as they might, the crew wasn't able to move the ship. She was stuck for good, moving only where the ice flow would take her. Several weeks passed. The expedition had ample provisions yet, and they were hunting for food too. But when the ice drifted, they were taken further with it. On September 20th, after four days of staying in one place, Stephenson decided to go over ice to the nearest island and hunt caribou deer there. He took five men and 12 dogs with him, left instructions for Captain Bartlett, and left, hoping to return in 10 days. For the first two days, the weather stood calm. On the third, however, a snowstorm came, and with it, the ice started moving. The ship was carried by the flow for several weeks, and the ice could break up and crush the car lock at any moment. But were still, as they drifted further away to the west, they all knew that Stephenson and his hunting party wouldn't be able to return. The drift continued for a month, then another one. With a heavy heart, Captain Bartlett ordered everyone to prepare to abandon ship at a short notice. And it proved to be the right decision. In the early morning of January 10th, the crew woke up to a huge shudder throughout the ship. The hull was torn apart by a chunk of ice. Everyone hurried onto the ice, carrying essential provisions and equipment. The car lock sank the next day, and the 25 people, two of them little children, were stranded on the treacherous ice of the Arctic. The team set up camp and made plans for a march to Wrangell Island, which they thought was several days' walk from there. They sent out a four-man scouting party, but two weeks later, only one of them returned, bearing news that the land they saw was Harold Island, not connected to bigger land. The other three members of the scouting team never came back. Upon the return of the only scout, another group of four people, unhappy with their captain, came to Bartlett and announced they were leaving on their own. They asked for provisions and assured him that he wouldn't be held responsible if anything happened to them. Bartlett agreed, and they left the next day, never to be seen again. Seven people fewer and with two kids on their hands, Captain Bartlett knew he had no time to waste. He ordered everyone to gather supplies, and when they were ready, the party began moving to Wrangell Island, which, as they now knew, lay in the opposite direction. They thought it would take 40 miles, but in reality, the distance was twice as long and much more dangerous than they expected. All in all, the party, divided into smaller groups for speed, spent three weeks on the move. The ice ridges were tall and menacing. The ice was constantly creaking and threatening to break, taking them into an unpredictable drift. The people had to overcome extreme cold, blizzards, and eventually hunger. By March 12th, when they finally reached the shores of Wrangell Island, most of the party were too exhausted to proceed. The ordeal took the heaviest toll on the children. Although the Inuit were used to harsh conditions, the kids were still too small for such trips, and they got ill on the way. Seeing that, Bartlett took the youngest Inuit hunter who proved to be the sturdiest, and they went across the ice to the Siberian coast in hopes of getting to Alaska from there and bringing help. The rest of the party stayed in a makeshift camp. The morale among the survivors was extremely low. The food was getting scarce, the cold was bitter, and the worst qualities of character arose in everyone in such conditions. The father of the Inuit family and other able men went to hunt, but even when they brought game, others suspected they didn't share everything. In the following weeks, fights broke out more and more frequently, and food was even harder to find. By July, they lost three more people. The situation was desperate, and the survivors kept to themselves as much as possible. Hunger was even worse than cold, and Karolok, the Inuit hunter, began noticing the weird and unnerving looks other men kept darting at his wife and daughters. No one knows what it would have ended if he hadn't caught a 600-pound walrus that provided the whole camp with fresh meat. But that wasn't enough to lift the spirits much. 
Another two months went by, and they were preparing for the winter on the ice, perhaps their last. But then, when all hope was lost, in the early hours of September 7th, the weary and apathetic people on the island were woken up by a strange sound, a whistle, somewhere far away. After a short while, it repeated, and the group went out of their shelters. At first, they didn't believe their eyes, but then exhausted but happy smiles blossomed on their faces. It was the King and Wing, a rescue ship that Captain Bartlett set for them. He made it to Alaska and immediately asked for urgent help. All 14 of the survivors were safely transported to Nome, Alaska. As for Stephenson, he survived as well, and by the time Bartlett arrived to America, he already set off for another trip. He returned four years later, claiming to have discovered three new islands. A colossal iceberg, more giant than a city, broke away from Antarctica in mid-2021. It's so big that it's 40 times bigger than Paris and 73 times the size of Manhattan. Imagine that you come out of your small holiday shack on the coast of South Africa, near the town of Port Elizabeth. You have a cup of tea in your hand as you've just woken up. You stand near the edge of your lookout, the vast Indian Ocean before you. Something catches your eye. To the right, there is something so monumental, you can't comprehend it. It's a giant slab of ice, 300 feet high, and stretching away many miles, as far as the eye can see. It rolls slowly, but relentlessly on, heading out into the deep sea. If it goes far enough, it could reach the western coast of Australia. Playing in front of it are a pod of dolphins, like they sometimes do off the bow of a ship. Yet they're just specks compared to the mammoth size. You're so shocked that you drop your cup. Your eyes are as big as saucers. It's like something out of a science fiction movie. Are you dreaming? Are you seeing things? Nope. It's A-76. It's real, and it's currently on the move. What could happen to it is anyone's guess. Well, scientists have a few theories, but let's get a grasp of its size first. The iceberg is 110 miles long and 16 miles wide. It's basically the shape of a gigantic finger. If you were standing at the coast of Dover, looking across the English Channel toward France, the iceberg would be almost as wide. The channel is 21 miles across at its narrowest. That means approximately two-thirds of that distance would be filled with the iceberg. That's if it were drifting, finger pointing down, so to speak. If it were facing the other way, it could still enter the English Channel. But as it got closer to the narrowest points, it would smash into the coasts of both England and France. It would go up over land. It would slide over the green fields of England, the white ice bold against the rich green. It would cruise past the vineyards of France. It was temporarily lowering the temperature of everything around it. Those grapes would be like jelly crystals. It would skim right over highways, cars stopping to observe this colossal thing like a visitor from another galaxy. You could pluck chunks off it for your drink as it sailed past. Failing that, you could scale it and go ice climbing, right on the outskirts of London. It would certainly be handy in the summer. But let's get back to what actually happened, and what scientists think will happen to it. As of the beginning of 2022, A76 is the world's most giant floating iceberg. It was calved from the Filchner Ron ice shelf in Antarctica in the middle of May 2021. Ice calving, also known as glacier calving, is the breaking up of ice chunks from the edge of a glacier. It then pulls away from the ice mass into a separate entity. If you were nearby, you would hear a lot of cracking and a massive booming sound. Blocks of ice up to 200 feet would break free and crash into the water. It would cause huge waves. Not even adventurous surfers would want to tackle those breakers. Ice calving is a natural event. The area where A76 broke off has seen little change in recent decades. There have been even larger chunks of ice than A76, but this one is currently the largest in the world. Scientists at the British Antarctic Survey spotted it. There are satellite images of it breaking free, as captured by the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1A satellite. The size at the calving was an estimated 1,670 square miles. Right now, it's in the Weddell Sea around Antarctica. The Weddell Sea is part of the Southern Ocean. 
It was named after the Scottish sailor, James Weddell, who entered the area in 1823. Scientists have deemed the Weddell Sea to have the clearest water of any sea. Imagine peering down into its depths from a boat. What a fantastic view it must be. The area is full of whales and seals. As you look down, you may see killer whales, humpback whales, minke whales, leopard seals, and crab eater seals. And if you look towards land, you'll likely see a colony of Adelie penguins. They're the dominant penguin species in this area because they adapt to the harsh environment. In fact, this is the only location in the world they live. What an incredible array of wildlife to observe, all from the comfort of the ship's deck while you drink another cup of hot tea. It gets pretty cold in these parts. To get an idea of what could happen to A76, scientists refer to other data, such as the even more enormous iceberg called A68. It was calved from the ice shelf known as Larsen Sea off Antarctica in 2017. While it may be exciting, though a little daunting, to think of it also sailing up the English Channel, A68 floated out to warmer seas and, by early 2021, had all but dissipated. That was a relatively quick demise. Some icebergs have been observed floating around for up to 18 years. Suppose they remain in the relatively cold waters. It all depends on where A76 decides to go. Satellites have helped scientists keep track of these monstrous movements, whereas they would go unnoticed in the past. That's how they know that by day 148, this iceberg had split into three fragments, imaginatively titled A76A, A76B, and A76C. The numbers might be boring, but they're based on the Antarctic quadrant in which they were first sighted. If these enormous chunks do break up entirely, it will not add to rising sea levels because it was already part of the floating ice shelf. Imagine these ice chunks in your glass. They already take up a certain amount of space. They will simply change form into water. Icebergs like this one are different from glaciers or ice sheets found on land. Those are the things that help to raise sea levels when they break off and melt. For example, if the whole of Antarctica's ice sheet were to melt, it could raise sea levels by nearly 190 feet. If you think A76 is enormous, and it clearly is, there was another that makes it look small in comparison. On record, the largest iceberg was sighted in November of 1956, 150 miles west of Scott Island in the South Pacific Ocean. Ironically, it was seen by a ship known as the USS Glacier. It was sized over 12,000 square miles. This iceberg was larger than the country of Belgium. What may happen to the chunks of A76 will depend on a few factors. Ocean currents can make a significant impact, and wind direction and speed can too. They may move closer to coastlines, where they can freeze into pack ice. They can also drift into shallow waters and hit the seabed, called seabed gouging. The deepest part of the iceberg can act like the keel of a boat. It digs into the ocean floor, but the sheer size of the iceberg keeps it moving. Soon it's tearing up the floor, creating a long, narrow furrow or a gouge. Fish would scatter, the earth would shake, the noise would be tremendous. It's actually quite common in offshore environments near where ice is found. You would not want to be scuba diving nearby when one of these rips through. However, it would make for a spectacular sight. Generally, icebergs deteriorate through melting and fracturing, which, as you can imagine, changes the mass and the surface area. Combined with wind and ocean currents, it can make iceberg modeling difficult. As for A76, we'll just have to wait and see. Before we go, let's return to our imaginary voyage down the English Channel. The island of ice, 73 times the size of Manhattan, with its gigantic frosty finger pointed down toward the Celtic Sea, rolling steadily onwards, unable to be stopped. Hundreds of thousands of people have flocked to the coasts of both England and France to watch this extraordinary spectacle as it cruises by. On top of the ice, there are thousands of penguins playing happily. They almost look to be waving back to the abundance of sightseers who cheer them on their way, the children jumping with joy at the most spectacular sight they've ever witnessed. There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. 
Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples. But because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. 
The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. In a frosty Canadian park, hidden deep beneath layers of thick ice, scientists discovered a bizarre skeleton they named the Frozen Dragon. The skeleton had been in the frozen ice for millions of years. It took experts decades to work out the species of this strange fossil. It was identified as a new genus of pterosaur. Pterosaurs were massive flying reptiles with wingspans of over 16 feet. Their heads were 3.5 times the size of their bodies. Pterosaurs lived 76 million years ago when they soared above the dinosaurs. Scientists described them as the biggest, meanest, and most bizarre animals that ever flew. The new genus has been named Cryodragon boreus, which translates to Frozen Dragon of the North Winds. In 2013, a young mountaineer was climbing one of the tallest mountains in Western Europe, Mont Blanc. He noticed a strange metal box poking out of the snow. The mountaineer pried the box open and found that it was filled with precious rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. The climber immediately handed the box to the authorities. It was discovered that the box likely belonged to a passenger on one of two flights from India 
that crashed into the mountain over 50 years ago. The box was valued to be worth over $200,000, and authorities are still searching for the heir to the small box of treasures. In northwest Siberia in 2007, a reindeer herder was on an outing with his sons when he noticed something strange in the ice. The man realized it was a frozen mammoth calf and immediately contacted the local museum. The calf was named Luba and was the best preserved mammoth mummy in the world at the time of its discovery. Luba had been in the ice for 41,800 years and is around 30 to 35 days old. From trunk to tail, the mammoth calf is roughly the same size as a large calf. If you're interested in seeing for yourself, Luba travels to museums all around the world. On the frozen continent of Antarctica, covered in layers of ice and snow, is Mount Erebus, the frozen volcano. The volcano was discovered in the middle of an eruption in 1841 by explorers on an Arctic expedition. The volcano is over 12,000 feet tall and has been active for the last 1.3 million years. Deep within the middle of the volcano is a huge crater filled with large volumes of molten lava. The volcano has occasional explosions, which means it's classified as being in continuing eruption. However, these eruptions are nothing to worry about because they're generally rather small. Back in 1991, two hikers were traveling across the Italian Alps when they stumbled across a body that they presumed to belong to a recently lost hiker. The duo trudged back down the mountain to report their unfortunate findings. Once the remains were recovered, it was clear that the body was not recent at all. Scientists determined that the Iceman was more than 5,000 years old and named him Otzi. The discovery was unlike anything scientists had ever before seen because the body was so well preserved. For years, Otzi was studied by scientists who discovered that our ancestors have a lot more in common with us than we ever knew before. Otzi was covered in ink body art Research done on the contents of his stomach revealed that his last meal was dry cured meat, similar to the bacon we eat today. Otzi has at least 19 relatives living today, somewhere in Central Europe. Scientists were researching ancient squirrel burrows in Siberia when they came across something interesting. One of the squirrels had hidden away precious seeds deep beneath the ground. The seeds had been encased in ice for 32,000 years. The seeds were for the flower Silene stenophilia, which had long since gone extinct. Amazingly, scientists were able to recover plant tissue from inside the seeds and grow an entire crop of flowers. They've since reintroduced the previously extinct flower to natural habitats all across the world. In 1930, a team of Norwegian scientists sailed around the Arctic Ocean, conducting research on the seas and glaciers. They reached White Island, a dangerous and icy land no human had set foot on before, or so they thought. The scientists were shocked to discover the tip of a small boat sticking out of the snow. Frozen inside the boat, they found scientific equipment and various personal items, including a jacket monogrammed S.A. Andre. They had discovered the wreck of the famous Andre Arctic Balloon Expedition. In 1897, Swedish explorers, led by Andre, attempted to travel to the North Pole by hydrogen balloon. No one had ever heard from them ever again. People only found out what happened to them when the wreck was discovered 33 years later. It turns out that the balloon had crashed on White Island only two days after departing from Sweden. The explorers traveled along the island on a small makeshift boat, but were unable to make it any further. The best preserved woolly mammoth ever found was discovered in an area of permafrost in Siberia in 2010. Scientists named the frozen mammoth Yuka after the small village near where it was found. Yuka had been frozen for 39,000 years and is thought to have been around six to eight years old. Because Yuka is so well preserved, it has been studied for years and provided new information about mammoths. In 2019, scientists reported that they were able to activate cells taken from Yuka's tissue. Maybe one day, we'll have woolly mammoths roaming the land. From looking at pictures and videos of Antarctica, the continent appears to be freezing cold, covered in snow and flat, except for a few small hills. Scientists believe that too. 
When studying the Gambertsev Mountains in the early 2000s, they were shocked to discover that the small rocky hills were actually the peak of a gigantic mountain formation under a mile of snow. Using radar technology, researchers worked out that the mountains are really around 10,000 feet tall and sprawl across 750 miles. This is around the same size as the European Alps, except hidden under tons of ice and snow. At a gold mine in Siberia, a businessman was examining a nearby river when he noticed something interesting in the frost. It was a small woolly rhino calf that was later named Sasha. The woolly rhino has been extinct for 15,000 years. It's thought that Sasha could have been frozen in the ice for up to 39,000 years. Sasha is unique because it's the only full-body woolly rhino to have ever been discovered. Glaciers around the northern Italian town of Palo have begun to melt. Artifacts from decades and even centuries ago have been discovered pouring out of the ice. Personal belongings from soldiers have been found things like diaries, photographs, and even love letters. Historians have even uncovered an entire cabin preserved beneath the ice. The cabin was filled with hard metal helmets and clothes. In 1845, Sir John Franklin embarked on an ill-fated expedition to the North Pole. The crew traveled on two ships, HMS Erebus and the ironically named HMS Terror. The expedition met with disaster, and both ships were lost to the icy waters. In 2016, the HMS Terror was discovered by a team of researchers. Despite being lost for 170 years, the freezing cold waters had maintained the ship in pristine condition. Scientists described the ship as frozen in time. Dinner plates and glasses were still on shelves, beds and desks were still in order, and even the passengers' luggage appeared to be in good condition. The HMS Erebus was also discovered nearby, but due to changing water conditions, the ship wasn't in great shape. The glacial ice surrounding a mountain passageway in Norway that was notoriously used by the Vikings has revealed hundreds of ancient artifacts. One of these artifacts was a giant unopened wooden box that was welded together. Researchers were beside themselves with anticipation, waiting to open this box. They believed it would be filled with Viking treasures or artifacts that would give us an insight into ancient society. When they opened the box, all that was inside was a plain old beeswax candle. It turns out that this box wasn't actually as old as they thought it was. By analyzing the candle, they discovered that the box dates back to the 17th century. The age of the Vikings had ended by the 11th century. It's likely that the candle box belonged to a farmer who was shipping it from his summer farm to his winter farm to light up the long nights.